is that the court does say that there is no bright line rule that requires a special warning every time evidence of post-offense conduct is admitted. And the general rule is it's for the jury to decide on the basis of the evidence taken as a whole whether the conduct after the offense related to the commission of the offense charge rather than to something else. And if it did relate to the offense charged, then it's for the jury to say how much weight, if any, that evidence should be assigned in their final determination of guilt or innocence. Of course, you know that when they say there's no special rule, there's always going to be an exception. So the exception is that where judicial experience teaches that jurors may attach more weight to the evidence than it warrants, the judge is to alert the jurors to this danger in their final instructions. You might ask yourself, how do judges know that? Little further help is offered about the circumstances that engage this obligation. I think it's fair to say, consistent with their general jurisprudence about uh, jury instructions, that no particular formula is required. But you might um, want to take something from the example they use, and the example they use is evidence of flight. And what was evidence of flight? It was the poster child for evidence of consciousness of guilt. So the next chapter, hopefully not in another white case. <laughs> I refer to this one as a paler shade of white. <laughs> With, and most of you aren't old enough, uh, due deference to Procol Harum. Uh, Gary Brooker and the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra, who did the song Whiter Shade of Pale. Um, the next chapter, no doubt, will involve an exploration of in what circumstances is one of these special warnings uh, required. I want to apologize for my uh, delay. There were a couple of unlawful objects I had to take care of. But <laughs> Enzo Rondinelli. Uh, we, we do have uh, one. You got your factum done? Greg's not here. Yes, that's right. Uh, we do have one question from the uh, webcast uh, group, and I guess this goes back to your opening remarks, Justice Watt, regarding um, appearing before, well, I guess maybe any appellate court, but mainly the Ontario Court of Appeal. Uh, what advice or tips would you have to counsel that is going to be appearing there for their first time, whether it's a bail pending or uh, an appeal, apart from saying, go watch experienced senior counsel that uh, are there all the time, um, because their concern is that they just uh, are concerned that they'll get it wrong when they show up there. Well, I think um, one of the things I'd, I'd suggest at the outset, and this, is, this advice will vary depending on um, um, and so whether you were counsel at, uh, whether the um, <coughs> appeal counsel was counsel at trial or not, um, in many instances, as I'm sure most of you know, um, counsel who appear before us are not counsel at trial. So if you're in that position, you need, um, you need a uh, um, solid information from trial counsel about what the potential grounds of appeal are. Um, although some prefer to draft a notice of appeal that consists of uh, boilerplate and in some instances it's perhaps unavoidable because you're just doing uh, something to preserve your client's uh, right of appeal, um, that does have consequences. And it'll have consequences uh, particularly um, in uh, bail pending appeal. Uh, because uh, one of the things that we take into account in deciding whether we will release an appellant pending the determination of his or her appeal is uh, whether you've got an arguable case. And if all we see is the conviction was against the evidence and the weight of the evidence, um, the conviction was contrary to law, the trial judge didn't apply a reasonable doubt correctly, 
Um, it's a bit hard to say on the basis of that um, that this is a case that's uh, got some arguable merit to it. So one of the early things you have to do is to uh, explore as best you can with trial counsel, uh, get a copy of the reasons for judgment if it's a judge alone trial, get a copy of uh, the uh, jury instructions, any rulings on the admissibility of evidence so that you can formulate at least more particularized grounds of appeal. You can always supplement them later. But uh, try not to start off, particularly if it's a case where you're, you'll be seeking bail pending appeal with a boilerplate notice of appeal. Uh, secondly, um, take a look at some notices of appeal that have been filed. Uh, talk to counsel about, um, uh, experience counsel, about the formulation of grounds of appeal. Uh, because that's your, that's your first document, that's the first impression that you make uh, with, <coughs> with the court. And uh, as the um, materials come in, the transcripts, uh, don't hesitate to get rid of grounds of appeal that don't have any root in the uh, proceedings below. By the same token, if something emerges from those proceedings below when you get the opportunity to review it, do not hesitate to file a supplementary notice or supplementary notices of appeal. When it comes to preparing the uh, further material, just to sort of skip a few, uh, a few steps along the way, um, the factum uh, is a very important document for us. Um, it is the document that attracts the attention of those who will hear this appeal. Uh, if, it, if it is um, disorganized, if it is replete with error, um, if it um, doesn't give us a balanced picture of what this case is about, human nature being what it is, uh, that's unlikely to attract our interest at the outset. So it should be organized, make use of subheadings, write it in plain language. There's no need for legalese. Um, avoid the uh, gratuitous sniping that we see in some facta, and I'm not limiting this to um, defense counsel. Uh, I've seen it in the prosecution factums as well. Um, that doesn't um, either um, speak well to your professionalism, uh, nor does it advance uh, your client's cause particularly. Um, we do read uh, all of the material, um, all of the material that's essential for us to get a grasp on the case. Uh, do we read every transcript? Of course we don't. We don't have enough time to do that. Um, we'll um, read all of the rulings that are put in issue, the charge, the reasons, the facta, and as much of the evidence as uh, we feel is necessary in light of the grounds of appeal that are raised. So be focused on what you um, have to say in your written materials and be equally focused in the submissions that you make um, during the course of oral argument. Above all, talk to people who do this on a regular basis. Our experience with them is that they'll be very helpful. So I guess I have to redo my factum. It'll be a little later now. <laughs> That's, well, uh, I think that was the one you promised on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be more of a trick than a treat, but uh, justice, justice first, just along the same vein, and I mean, you've done many, many jury trials as a defense counsel, and but you only had your performance to judge it against, but now that you're on the bench and you've seen a lot more performances from different counsel, any similar tips to those counsel that are going into their first jury trial? Well, this is not a novel comment. You've probably all heard it from various people along the way. You have to have for lack of a better word, a theory of your case. You have to have a position that you ultimately want to argue to the jury. And the time to develop that in your mind is not the night before you have to give your jury address. Before the jury trial starts, you should have developed that position or that theory. And everything you do, ideally, 
uh, during the course of the trial is directed to building that position, building that theory, so that what you're doing when you stand up to address the jury is not giving the jurors a synopsis of all of the evidence that you think might possibly be helpful to your cause, but you're weaving the bits and pieces of the evidence that support your client's defense into your jury address. I, I, I have to say, not just on the topic of jury trials or jury addresses, that um, when I talk to my colleagues who come from a civil law background, a civil litigation background, who as judges are just starting to hear criminal cases, what I hear from them time and time and time again is how surprised they are at the level of advocacy within the criminal bar, both defense counsel and crown counsel, and how much more skillful the advocacy is from criminal counsel, defense and crown, than it is from uh, most counsel in the civil litigation context. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, even if you're just starting out, you're probably going to court reasonably frequently. Um, you have an opportunity to hone your advocacy skills, and so your address to the jury really is, is the time when you should, you know, all of those advocacy skills should be coming together. And, and if you've thought through the position that you're going to argue, the theory of your side of the case, well in advance of the trial starting, you've developed it as the evidence unfolds, then you're going to tie it all together for the jury in your address. Bear in mind as trial counsel, you're creating the record. As appellate counsel, you're interpreting the record. Well, I'd like to express our thanks again for both of you to attend. This was quite nostalgic, especially for me. Um, <laughs> It feels like we're back at Osgood, and it was, I'm glad to see it's as informative and entertaining as it was just two years ago. So that's, uh, that's quite, quite nice. We're going to pip the ride now. <laughs>